Good day, all. I'm Daphne Pillay, the president of the International Women's Federation of Commerce and Industry, India National Chapter. And on behalf of IWFCI India, I welcome you all to our third virtual fireside chat on the topic, sectors leading change in the COVID era. The COVID-19 crisis has now exceeded more than 100 days. India has entered 118 days of lockdown. And in the world over, we have had days of lockdown, semi-lockdown, lifting of lockdown, and reimposing of lockdown. And yet, the world is still struggling with answers to address the various challenges posed by the pandemic crisis. In education, we wonder how we will continue to fulfill the promise of education to children. What will be the long lasting effects of this experience on young children? If schools are not open, then how will students cope with distance learning? And how can parents ensure that they are in a position to perform their everyday workplace duties? Additionally, when once the world was in awe and gratitude that we could fly from Delhi to San Francisco in a single day, when global businesses flourished but were taken for granted. Today, such a long distance journey on a non-stop flight has become disconcerting and even terrifying to some. How to keep safe while traveling is one of aviation's new challenges. With all of this going on, all eyes are on the pharmaceutical companies of the world who are racing towards finding treatments, running effective trials, and developing vaccines that will hopefully put an end to this pandemic. Today, the focus is on these three vital sectors, which will be leading change in COVID and post-COVID times. Our experts are from the fields of education aviation, and pharma. And I invite Ms. Diana Ebruzzi, the visionary founder and international chair of the International Women's Federation of Commerce and Industry, a women's organization headquartered in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, to address our viewers. Diana's passion towards empowering women and young girls through entrepreneurship led her to start 13 IWFCI chapters in different parts of the globe. Miss Diana Ebruzzi. Thank you, Daphne, for your very, very kind words. Well, as we all know, we are now living in a more complicated and fast changing world with interconnected problems and challenges. All governments, businesses, and institutions worldwide are undertaking initiatives to try and define these problems. But how does the world address all these challenges to feed into interconnected global systems or attract wider public attention for more impact? We've seen the emerging contours of the world of work in the fourth industrial revolution which is rapidly becoming a living reality for millions of workers and companies around the world. However, in order to truly rise to the challenge of formulating a winning workforce strategy for the fourth industrial revolution, businesses will need to recognize human capital investment as an asset rather than a liability, not a cost, but a benefit. This is particularly imperative because there is a virtuous cycle between new technologies, upskilling, and survival. New technology adoption drives business growth with new job creation and expansions of existing jobs. Provided it can fully leverage the talents of a motivated and agile workforce, who are equipped for the future-proof skills to take advantage of the new opportunities provided by continuous retraining and upskilling. Conversely, skill gaps both among workers 
and among an organization's senior leadership may significantly hamper new technology adaption and therefore business growth. Therefore, we need to provide a platform for leaders to understand current socioeconomic transformations and shape a future in which people are at the heart of economic growth and social progress. I am a great believer in activities that support and empower anyone with the responsibility of leadership in managing the future of their work and the teams that rely on this work. Is this the end of the world as we know it? Right now, countries are asking themselves, how reliant are we on other countries? How much do we want to be reliant on others and with whom? As nationalistic and concerning as this sounds, it is to an extent understandable after the seeds of doubt and fear have been sown from this pandemic and the economic chaos that is following. But this ripple effect should be no surprise as disasters really only draw attention to long-standing unaddressed frailties and weaknesses. Crises have a way of bringing to the fore issues that are easy to ignore in the good times. And globalization is one of these things. The pandemic fallout unfolding as we speak has been a catalyst to consider interdependence and trust, reliable friends and supply lifelines. What typically happens after you get a crisis like this is people start talking about new eras, tipping points, etc., and how the post-pandemic world will look or be different. But you know, the really the trends were already in motion before this pandemic arrived. It has only accelerated this re-evaluation. Either way, this pandemic has created the biggest economic crisis of our lifetime, putting extreme pressure on not just SMEs, who will always be the hardest hit, but the idea of free markets, liberal democracy, the rule of law, and free enterprise as stabilizing pillars of our civilization. In the month of March 220, the whole world, except a few wiser independent nations, lost its ability to reason, throwing their economic babies up with the bathwater because of fear and statistics. Quite incredible. God help us all. This is indeed a huge subject on its own, which I believe will have a greater impact on our, on our lives than we realize. So, as to the question of sectors leading change, but with my limited time, I will address the ones that stand out the most. Digital marketing has experienced a major boom, as most industries which experience a significant decline have turned to digital marketing techniques to survive. So when the pandemic is over, businesses will need to get their cash flows back fast and on track, making them open to innovation and affordable ways to reach customers. And digital marketing will do this. Take this lockdown as an opportunity to develop your digital marketing toolkits. Then we come to online education. The pandemic has shut down schools, universities, primary schools, and no one knows for how long students will have to stay, come or go again. This reality has forced the need for online learning plans with new technology and techniques for student and faculty. I will not say any more on this subject as we have a very eminent speaker and Dr. Pele, founder of Pele Group of Institutes on our panel, who will speak a lot more in depth on this subject. So let's have a look at e-commerce. Due to self-isolation, we all know people who've normally, who normally visit physically store, physical stores are increasingly shopping online. This uplift in e-commerce may very well become permanent if people remain wary of mingling in real life shops, I have to say, I still like shopping in real shops. 
Jack Ma, Alibaba, got his first real chance when the Chinese had to stay at home due to the first SARS outbreak in 2002. This quarantining just happened to come as Alibaba was to prepare, was preparing to launch Tabo online, um, online marketplace for consumers that Jack Ma was hoping to use to compete with eBay in China. Chinese consumers who were stuck at home started turning to the internet in the millions to order items. Alibaba benefited from this, and with the internet becoming increasingly, increasingly more necessary for doing business during the SARS outbreak, and the same will continue to help it elsewhere right now. You may think e-commerce has already taken off. But places like South Africa and other countries say only a fraction of their population have bought online. There's a lot of room still to go. So going forward very quickly, companies will realize they will have less need for expensive real estate and will start to look for a new balance. Now, let's have a look at agriculture, which is extremely important. Um, in feeding the nations. And one of our biggest challenge with the pandemic, pandemic and lockdowns is the threat to food security. A major con consequence is shortage of food and a hike in prices. This COVID-19 is disrupting, disrupting agricultural activities around the world from farm harvesting to processing and supply. The closure of restaurants, eateries, and hotels is also creating a low demand for agricultural products. At the end of this pandemic, at lockdowns, we could be faced with a risk of low food supplies. Now, this will create opportunities in the agricultural sector for innovative growing techniques and supply channels. Agritech food factories will be the new norm. Now, I'm not sure how many of you heard about the gig economy. It is as companies will not want or need to have huge numbers of full-time employees at fixed costs. This will accelerate the gig economy where freelance work, collaborative contract startups will emerge as the norm. There is a need to start preparing yourself to function in this gig economy over the longer term. People and businesses that choose to prepare and adapt to these underlying changes will succeed and the ones that don't will be disrupted and forgotten. Now I'm going to just quickly say something in closing. I would like to encourage us all during these uncertain times as we navigate our ways forward to trust our intuition more and not our brains on this occasion. We store a vast and sophisticated bank of knowledge that is unconsciously picked up by our bodies and which we use in everyday lives. For instance, empathy is not learned through intellectual or theoretical understanding, but through our bodies. As we watch other people observe their actions and intentions, emotions and feelings, our bodies spark a mirror neurons, which allows us to walk in other people's shoes. And, we, and you know, we often hear of business people who talk about their gut instincts, about a deal or a situation, an expression of a type of learning acquired through the body and life's experiences. Just remember, before technology, we used our gut feelings, which proved very reliable. Don't lose it. With a dependency on technology, is it may save you from making a disastrous mistake. So finally, I say, have faith. We will never forget this experience, and we will learn from it, and we will be more prepared in the future, and we will overcome. I would now like to hand over to the proceedings to our moderator, Mrs. Annie Kuma. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
My name is Annie Kumar, and I'm extremely privileged to be here today uh, representing my organization, IWFCI, to have a conversation like, uh, you know, Diana mentioned, with eminent industry experts who are going to talk to us about their experiences, uh, you know, what they think is the new normal all about. And most importantly, I was having a conversation with, uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, with Rama uh, some time back, and I was saying that, you know what, this whole conversation turns around to be something very simple. It's like we're talking about elements today. We talk about earth, we're talking about water, and we're talking about air. We're talking about education, we're talking about um, pharmacy, pharma, and we're talking about aviation. With any further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to you our very eminent speakers for the day. I'd like to start in no particular order with uh, Dr. K. M. Vasudevan Pille who is the founder and CEO of Mahatma Education Society's Pillay Group of Institutions. The society has completed 50 years in the science service of education and runs 48 institutions from pre-primary to postgraduate levels at multiple locations. These include schools, international schools, college of architecture, engineering, management studies, arts, science and commerce, polytechs, teachers training institutes and others, servicing around 30,000 students annually. He is the author of the book, Education, The Dream of an Indian Empowered. The book is an exhaustive reference point for policymakers, institution builders, teachers, and educa educators. Welcome, Dr. Pillay. I'd like to introduce Dr. Deepa Pillay, he is a senior farm industry professional with 20 years in research and development in India, Indian, US, European, Asian pharmaceutical industry. Having worked earlier with multinational companies like Ron Poulenc and Novartis and GlaxoSmithKline, he's currently based in Shanghai and working as the Chief Technology Officer at EOC Pharma, a company engaged in research and development of novel anti-cancer drugs. Welcome, Dr. Hegde. I'd like to invite now Dr. Bala Bhartwaj, who's the Managing Director of Boeing's Engineering and Technology Center in India. He joined Boeing in 18, 1987 and has held various technology leadership positions in India since uh, 2009. He has established a large aerospace engineering and technology center for Boeing in India. Dr. Bhardwaj holds a B.Tech degree in aeronautical engineering with a distinction from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, a PhD in aerospace engineering from Georgia uh, Institute of Technology and an MBA from University of California at Irvine. He has been recognized by NASA, Boeing, and industry groups with several awards. He's current, he currently serves as the president of SAE India and is actively engaged with various industry bodies. Please welcome Dr. Bhattwaj. I thank you all for taking the time to be here today. I really do. Um, I, I'd like to start this conversation uh, uh, with Dr. Pillay, uh, if it's okay. And I really want to know, um, with the COVID-19, the global pandemic, it has significantly, Dr. Dis uh, you know, disrupted the education sector. Can you please share with me your views on, on its impact in India um, and also around the world, please? Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I welcome all of you this uh, morning. Education is one of the earliest pillars of life. It is the lifeblood of a nation without which uh, people will not be uh, will, will lead uh, without which uh, the nation will lead to intergenerational poverty, deprivation, and uh, backwardness. 
in order in an attempt to contain covid educational systems all over the world has been severely affected leading to closure of preschools schools colleges and universities as of 7th june 2020 approximately 1.725 billion people are out of the school due to the closure of the uh, schools uh, uh, at the onset of the pandemic 134 countries have uh, nationally implemented the uh, above mentioned uh, closure 38 countries are still implementing total closures impacting about 98.8% of the world population uh there are uh, several uh, countries which uh, uh uh countries where the public education system has been severely affected because on account of the covid due to the pandemic several national and international colleges and universities have postponed their exams and entrances pandemic has shown that we are in an uncharted territory the earliest uh, comparison is the spanish flu in 1918 where the whole world uh, schools schools were uh, closed for about 4 months when the nationwide lockdown took place india was uh, at the crossroads in the month of march we had uh, the annual examinations all around the country the cet is all around the country preparing students for the it's controlled by the government preparing students for the 2021 session then the final examinations all the competitive examinations all over the all over the country and finally the the high school and the secondary schools not able to conduct the examinations there was a lot of discussion on the promotion of students and almost 300 million students have been affected in india because of this pandemic it is also endangered uh, the endangered the social and economic framework of india especially the economic because of the uh, stoppage of the midday meal and many other uh, 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 governmental measures to uh, uh, promote uh, government educational systems it also has taught us the great divide in india the digital divide in india uh, that's about uh, 42% of the city population has internet access and only about 14.9% have the rural uh, connectivity access to and also about 14% only have the smartphones further teachers were also ill equipped both functionally and uh, qualitatively however with the uh no options left schools and colleges have turned into online teaching programs and uh, without any preparation and therefore only the initially the only the elite schools and colleges and university could start with the online programs now the great divide also has shown us that the governmental schools only the governmental schools and the uh, pre schools and uh, jilla parishad schools could not start with the online programs thereby totally closing down during this time 
access to healthy meals also have been uh, uh, halt in uh, anganwadis government schools leading to uh, nutritional hazards online education has uh, given a lot of flexibility to the self paced learning and convenience it also gave uh, higher uh, education a lot of uh, consideration self discipline and time management it has been observed that an average student retain about 25% while uh, attending the online classes whereas when you regularly attend a lecture you have only about uh, 8 to 10% of memory online education also has helped about 40 to 60% of the time for students for higher education thank you thank you much uh, that was a lot of information it had a lot of clarity what really surprised me is this true disparity between rural and urban access to education um uh, thank you so much dr pille i'd like to please uh, uh, i have a question for dr deepak khekre it is a, it's a question that everybody really wants to know it's how is uh, how has the covid 19 um, you know the global uh, the global pharma index industry adopted uh, and basically effect on the like hospitals the present clinical trials of new drugs the um, effect on drugs other than covid-19 because that's become the whole focus right now but i'm sure that there are many other clinical trials of different drugs which have been on but the focus suddenly coming on to covid-19 how has that affected the global pharma industry yeah firstly i'd like to thank the international women federation of commerce and industry for inviting me to be a part of this panel discussion and uh, it is our privilege to have you here doctor yeah and also any thank you for the kind words of introduction earlier on so uh, this pandemic has affected like most of the other major sectors the covid-19 pandemic has also affected the pharma industry in a very big way and i'd like to Uh, divide this uh, into two parts one is the effect on the global industry and then something very closer to home uh, in india so basically uh, the disruptive effects of the covid-19 have placed an enormous amount of strain uh, on the global supply chain and this has increased tremendously the risk of shortages of drugs and what this pandemic has done is basically it has increased uh, the global risk of uh, over reliance on global supply chains on cheap sources and uh, this covid-19 has also affected the ongoing clinical trials in a very big way and focus has shifted from the clinical trials of the drugs which are already ongoing that has actually shifted now and total focus is on covid-19 itself so how this has affected is basically this has affected uh, non enrollment of patients in the uh, clinical trials which are already ongoing a lot of the patients have actually dropped out of the clinical trials and this has also increased the risk of non compliance of the study protocols so this is seen as a major risk and this has also affected the patients with other chronic illnesses which require medical uh, attention in spite of uh, covid so this has been the major effect and the global neglect of preparedness to uh, deal with this kind of a pandemic this has also brought the focus of uh, of the world on the rather unprepared nature it's surprising because george bush uh, junior in 2005 when he was addressing the national institute of health in the us he had predicted about this pandemic and the ways how the world could be actually be prepared for the pandemic he had talked about things like stockpiling of drugs being prepared in terms of uh, preparation of vaccines and also how to increase the public's public and the regulators interaction these are things that he had already predicted but unfortunately nothing of this came to pass there's a general tendency to focus on uh 
something that's very near term and more in focus and that's what exactly happened the scare of the pandemic actually got lost and we are not ready in terms of pandemic and this has also affected a lot of things uh, in terms of health ancillaries uh, this has exposed the shortcomings of the medical support equipment things like uh, ventilators and basic things like n95 masks or even three ply surgical masks and currently uh, closer to home there is a lot of reliance on innovation or what we call as jugaad in order to innovate to be prepared to meet something which is good in terms of a crisis but i think this also has brought into focus the need for systematic planning in key areas uh, to have a strategic vision for these kind of issues this covid 19 has also brought into focus what will be the new normal for the pharma industry so when you look at the new normal in my opinion it's going to be on three different planes one of them is going to be directly affecting the companies so when you're talking about companies the supply chain reorganization to reduce the risk on only one party is going to be one that's going to be the major one secondly the focus is going to be uh, uh, for the companies it's going to be on agility agility uh, resiliency as well as transparency and we will have new things like digital and analytics being the key engines of acceleration in terms of working working patterns this is also going to affect the working remote working is going to become more uh, common there will also be a lot of demand for new kinds of talent as well as new capabilities let's come to the second part uh, when we talk about the new normal which is actually for the industry pharma industry as a whole so in terms of the industry the networks will have to be when i say networks i'm talking about supply chain networks the supply chain networks will have to rebalance in terms of the cost and the risk new technologies uh, will shift the overall industry requirements supply chains will see a major change in becoming patient centric digital tools and telehealth and app based systems so basically they are going to be more uh, patient centric supply chains closer to home you could also see a uh, reshoring uh, when i say reshoring i mean currently india relies a lot on manufacturing of apis or starting materials and intermediates which are involved in the manufacturing of apis this pandemic has brought into focus the reliance of the indian pharma industry on non indian sources so this can have a major effect it's also a wake up call for our government to look at it more this issue more strategically and build it up and this is also in line with our prime minister mr modi's call for a atmanirbhar bharat in terms of the apis so these are going to be in my opinion uh, the major changes for the industry when we are talking about the new normal in terms of the government third effect is going to be on the government so the new normal will we we'll see the government more involved in crisis decisions as well as responses to crisis uh when we talk about this pandemic yes there are a lot of risks but also every crisis actually brings opportunities with it there are also some positives from this opportunities for the pharma industry during this whole phase of the pandemic what we have seen is unprecedented levels of openness and collaboration between companies a lot of companies are relying on collaborations rather than working individually in beat development of drugs development of vaccines you can see this happening very quickly also reshoring of critical capabilities for safeguarding national health drugs as well as ancillaries this is something that's going to be positive uh, about the world including india one major change which is also coming about is in the simplification of the over complicated requirements from regulators so we see a lot of emphasis which is based on regulators in approval of the manufacturing sites of apis or drug products so they actually go in for personal inspections at the manufacturing sites 
but during this whole kind of uh, this whole pandemic this is changing the regulators have realized that travel is next to impossible at this period of time so how do you do it so they have actually when i say uh, regulators regulators like usfda or ema from europe they have actually issued guidelines how they could do remote assessment of manufacturing facilities and approve them for supply of chain so this is something unprecedented this has never happened before so this kind of a crisis which has arisen due to covid 19 this is also bringing in several uh, opportunities the next part i'd like to focus is on the vaccines because that's currently the hottest topic going on so when you look at the whole global picture of vaccines we have over 145 vaccines that are currently in development of this about 125 of them are in the preclinical stage 15 of them are undergoing phase 1 clinical trials 10 are undergoing phase 2 clinical trials four are undergoing phase 3 clinical trials and one of the vaccines has actually been approved for limited use when you look at uh, the vaccines they are similar to drugs in terms of the development procedures so they undergo a series of testing so these are called stages so the first stage is the preclinical testing where these are tried on mice or monkeys to see if they produce an immune response so the vaccines have a lot of vaccines have already gone through this then you have something called as phase 1 wherein <coughs> uh you evaluate the safety of the new vaccine before it proceeds for uh, further clinical trials so the focus is basically on the safety as well as on the dosing then the vaccines undergo phase 2 clinical trials or what are called as expanded trials <clears throat> in this you have hundreds of people who are split into groups so these groups can be elderly or children and basically the focus is to see how they behave differently <clears throat> so here in this phase uh, these vaccines test uh, the safety and also the ability of the vaccines to uh, stimulate the immune system in case of phase 3 trials these are also called as efficacy trials <clears throat> in this thousands of people actually get the vaccines to see how they can get infected when they are compared with volunteers which also receive placebo so placebos are these are not drugs so these are just not containing the drug but everything else that can be in the medicine so this particular phase actually determines uh, the if the vaccine can protect from coronavirus the next stage which is one of the most important stages is how the regulators review the results and see what is to be approved there's something also called as emergency use authorization Uh, before approval this is highly likely going to happen in case of vaccines uh, we also we already saw this in case of one of the drugs uh, remdesivir which was approved uh, in the us by the us fda where they approved it for emergency use in only certain classes of patient not as a general use lastly because given the nature of the pandemic and the scale of the pandemic there is also a possibility for combining uh, different phases of vaccine development so you can combine phase 1 and phase 2 to accelerate the development so let me give you Wonderful. an overview of different types of vaccines so there are three three or four different kinds of vaccine one of them is the first one is called as a uh, genetic vaccines so what you do is in this you actually use one or more of the coronavirus genes to provoke an immune response and i'll just give you a couple of examples which have been in the news in one way or the other so one of them is the moderna vaccine which is currently in phase 3 you saw the hype that was created uh, in may when phase 1 results were uh, announced based on eight uh, patients second one in the same category is uh, biontech pfizer and fosun pharma collaboration again as i said collaboration is unprecedented so this is for a german company us company and chinese companies collaborating in the look for a vaccine so these were uh, results of are uh, announced for this vaccine on july 1st with moderate side effects target is to get there by 2020 end so we have hope 
in this kind of vaccine. And closer to home, Zydus Cadilla is also in the same category of vac uh, vaccine developers. So in case of Zydus Cadilla, this is a DNA-based vaccine. Uh, on July 3rd, they announced the approval to start the human trials. And this is the second company, Indian company, after Bharat Biotech, to start development of the vaccines. The second class of uh, vaccines that we have is the viral vector vaccines. So basically, you use the virus here to deliver the coronavirus genes into the cells to provoke an immune response. In this, again, you must have heard about the University of Oxford, uh, which has been collaborating with AstraZeneca, and they also uh, uh, intend Tie, tie up with Bharat serums uh, in India for global supplies as well. This is also going to be watched very carefully. Other one, uh, which is not very well known, is a vaccine that's been developed by CanSino Biologics uh, in China. This company uh, has completed phase one and phase two trials, and they already approved limited uh, this vaccine for limited use. So this has been approved for use in the military where they are carrying out phase three trials in the soldiers. This was announced on June 25th. And the last vaccine again in this category is the Russian one, which was in, in news a few days back, uh, the, uh, the Gamaleya Research Institute, which actually completed phase three. And this is a combination of two adenoviruses, AD5 and AD26, both engineered with the coronavirus gene. Next class is a protein-based vaccines. These vaccines use coronavirus protein or protein fragment to provoke an immune response. So in this class, closer to home, uh, is the vaccine being developed by Bharat Biotech, ICMR, uh, Indian Council of Medical Research, and the National Institute of Virology. They're developing a vaccine named as Vaxin. And so this basically vaccine is an in inactivated virus, uh, rabies virus engineered. Uh, to carry proteins from the coronavirus. So this started uh, human trials across India on the 14th of July. And the target is to make it available by 15th August. Uh, seems the long haul as of now, but it still brings hope. And also as a country, it brings pride as well. And the last category of vaccines. Absolutely. Is a, yeah. And the last category of vaccines is a repurposed vaccines. So these basically use vaccines which are already used. Something which is very familiar to all of us is the BCG vaccine, which was discovered in 1900s. But now there is a phase three trial which is ongoing uh, in Australia. And the Murdoch Children Research Institute is carrying out this study to bring out this vaccine to see if it can be done by the end of the year. So this is an overview of the whole, all uh, efforts that are on on the on the vaccine space that's that's really wonderful i think it's it's really hopeful because it's based on on pure data that what you've shared with us is very hopeful because it makes us believe that you're actually talking about trials you're talking about you know um uh, trials that are really in place right now that there is hope that there's going to be a vaccine and coming from you uh, i think this is this is something that can be believed this can something that generates a lot of goodwill and I'm, I'm really glad that you've been able to share this data with us uh, may i please um, uh, you know ask dr bardwaj uh, the next question uh, it, it's um, it's it's um, it's very simple it's what's happening is the covid pandemic doctor uh, continues around the world many global aerospace and defense Industry companies like the Boeing are feeling the impact during these very uncertain times. Could you kindly share with us the impact on aerospace industry, uh, especially Boeing in particular, please? Yeah, thank you, Annie. Uh, very insightful uh, comments there from uh, Dr. Deepak. Uh, our industry is very different. Uh, when times are good, people like to travel and uh, that's one of the big things that the aerospace industry has been enabling people to do. Whether you are traveling for business or pleasure, connecting people is what you know the industry is very well known for. Uh, but in really, uh, I, I want to kind of let you know that aerospace is more than just the commercial travel that we are all used to. You can think of aerospace having broadly, maybe even four segments. 
Uh, one would be the commercial travel that many of us get on an airplane and go somewhere, either internally within a country or internationally. Second part is about transporting cargo. And uh, most of us are stuck at home. We are uh, expecting you know, another company like an Amazon or a Flipkart or somebody else deliver things to us. And transporting cargo, including medicines, uh, is a very important part of what the aerospace industry does. And that part actually is happening much more. There are airlines today that have kind of converted their passenger aircraft uh, to be able to carry cargo. So car carrying the cargo, uh, providing, you know, PPE equipment, uh, you know, those kinds of things have become very important. So that part of the aerospace industry is actually more active today than it used to be uh, before the, the pandemic came in. The third aspect of aerospace is around defense. Uh, you know, the, the country is fighting with each other. That hasn't stopped. On the one hand, we are fighting the virus and taking you know, all the actions needed there. Uh, but at the same time, countries have their own ideas about what to do about their borders. So defending your territory uh, by way of fighter aircraft, helicopters, transport aircraft, all those kinds of things are very much you know, needed. Those parts, again, are not affected by the virus. And then, of course, we all get excited when we have space. Uh, based missions, launching of a satellite, launching of humans into space, those kinds of things. And those are also not affected uh, because the people who are involved in those areas are taking precautions. Now, let me come back to aviation. Uh, when we talk about aviation, there is, I mean, that's the part that most of us get impacted by directly. Aviation sector is very uh, significantly impacted by this. People used to go. Uh, you know, we, we would like to get on an airplane and go somewhere. Uh, and I think especially in India, you know, there's a lot of in, internal travel between cities in India. Uh, there is also a fair amount of international travel that India had gotten into. Last several years, the growth rate in aviation in India was phenomenal. In fact, India was one of the fastest growing countries in terms of the number of people getting on an airplane and traveling. All that has come to naught. Uh, in fact, uh, there is the International Air Transport Association, IATA, and they are basically predicting that the, the amount of aviation activity in 2020 will be something along the lines of 40% of what it was in 2019. And what this means is there's a large number of aircraft uh, some estimates are of the order of 16,000 passenger aircraft, which have been grounded because there's no need for them to be flying around. They're all sitting in airports, hangars. In fact, we don't have enough hangars to store all these because normally they would all be flying. They would be parked at the gate or in the air. Now, if you bring all these people and you know put them, uh, tell them to park them, we are actually now using runways and parking spaces you know, to uh, and they have converted the runways into parking spaces. Uh, and then there are pictures. If you go to the Internet and search, you will see large number of aircraft just stacked one after the other, you know, like in a parking situation. And of course, this is not good news for the airlines because airlines, you know, the, the airplanes themselves are pretty expensive. They have very complex machines. They're also expensive. They need certain level of use and regular maintenance. Many of you probably have a, a, an automobile at home or maybe even a two wheeler. If you were to go away on vacation for a month and come back, you say a prayer before you start the vehicle because you don't know, you know whether things are going to work the way uh, they are supposed to. Now, airplanes are similar. They are considerably more complicated machines you know, than a, a two wheeler or an automobile. So they require a certain level of regular maintenance, even if they are not flying. There are things inside the airplane that have to be taken care of so that they don't deteriorate. There are protocols uh, in terms of, you know, what is needed. You know, Dr. Deepak was talking about, uh, you know, regulations, uh, you know, with respect to the medical industry. There are equally, strong regulations when it comes to the aerospace industry, especially the aviation industry. 
And those regulations require that these aircraft are maintained. There are certain kinds of you know, specific things that have to be done for the engine, for the systems inside the airplane. Uh, so those kinds of things. So all this puts a burden on the airline, whether they are flying the airplane or not, it puts a burden on the airline. And if the airlines are not, you know, flying the airplanes, many of them are saying, why do I need to buy new airplanes? So there is a fair amount of uh, cancellation happening, uh, both on the Boeing side as well as on the Airbus side. Now, if you if you search the internet, you will find that both Boeing and Airbus have announced that we are going to cut back on the production rate. If we were making you know X number of aircraft, you know we are now cutting back and reducing the number of airplanes we make, uh, and that of course means we we need fewer people. It impacts the entire supply chain. You know the supply chain in aerospace is extremely complex. It is global in nature. There are companies in India who make parts, send them over to the U.S. to be assembled, you know, on Boeing airplanes. Similarly, there are companies in India that make airplane, you know, parts, send them to Toulouse, uh, let's say, where they get assembled to, into Airbus airplanes. So now the Airbus and Boeing are not making airplanes. Obviously, you know, the suppliers have less work to do. So this is a, uh, a situation that impacts you know not just the, the the prime oem company but it impacts a lot of other companies downstream you know and these companies are situated you know throughout the world uh there are specific things that boeing is doing uh maybe i can answer that you know as part of another question and you know, i don't want to hog the conversation here uh boeing has actually launched something called the confident travel initiative and the Confident Travel Initiative is, is this, you know, an initiative that Boeing is taking because Boeing wants uh, the public to get back on the airplanes. Uh, that is what, you know, they were built for. That is what gives us some comfort that maybe life is coming somewhat back to normal. But clearly there are, you know, additional things we have to do. So I can address that, you know, if there is interest in that, you know, as part of another, another question maybe. So let me pass the ball back, uh, Annie. You can go Thank to you. the next Thank question. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I think it was it was very clear. I love the whole uh, segregation when you divided this because for everybody, aviation just is about commercial travel where, because we all associate it only with one particular thing. Uh, thanks to the kind of uh, you know information that you have shared with us now, we I think have um, an, a better idea that you. As, as cargo, I think like when you said that you're doing more work there, we never realize the things that when you know when you think order things online, when you're expecting to be safe at home and things are getting delivered to your doorstep, there's some uh, amount of work that's happening on the back. And I think now we know that aviation yeah. is a big part so, of that. So I, I want to add something to that. Uh, you know, we all today take GPS for granted. We take the internet mm -hmm. for granted. You know, people are talking about satellite phones and communication and so forth. All that was enabled by aviation. You know, the, you know Boeing was one of the early companies that launched the satellites that have become, you know, the GPS system that we, every one of us, I'm sure, you know, whether we are actually driving in a vehicle or we sometimes get into, you know, a, a taxi or some other, uh, some other uh, vehicle owned by someone else. We immediately say, how am I going to get there? You know, what, you know, Google Maps or something like that. So aviation has played a tremendous part in many things that we take for granted today. And some of those things are continuing. So, you know, I just want the audience to understand that while one part is severely impacted uh, yes. and, and the part that maybe we, you know, we think of first, there are other hidden parts of aviation that many of us don't even think about because you know we don't know where the gps signal comes from it actually comes from satellites that are up there and who put them up there you know it's aviation that you know the aerospace industry that put them up there. yeah so it, it, it now we know better so it's a you know better you do better is like so i think now every time i'm going to look at my gps i'm going to say thank you aviation i'm i'm just going to remember you dr badwaj and also thank you for sharing this information with with us your, your audience um, may i um, you know come back to dr pille 
for a question which is very important uh, to uh, to me personally as a parent as well because you know i have um, i have a child and um, this question about him uh, you know an online education about uh, you know as a parent you have concerns about device based education uh, which is not just for him he's he's elder he's in the 12th standard but you still have smaller children there so i'd like your view uh, dr pidle on what you think education system going online what is your do you have any concerns about it and what is it that you would like to share dr pidle please see the thank you any uh, see the uh, what is important is the online education which has now been introduced in the uh, kindergarten and preschools and uh, in standard first and second as the children are home bound uh, from uh, uh and uh, uh, with the parents parents are worried what will be their uh, next course of action they have been at home for the last 3 uh, 4 months and uh, they should have continued with the preschool education and uh, the first 1000 days before they go to first grade is very important for the development of a child and it is in this context that we should understand what do we teach in the preschools we in the preschools we allow them to socialize we allow them to uh, you know write numbers learn alphabets sing nursery rhymes together uh, uh, in, uh, in groups uh, we make them fight not that we make them fight they fight and they make up and they eat together they play together and uh, this environment is continued for or a, a period of time and uh, and this continues for uh, uh, quite some time and then they are prepared to go to school so experiments have showed that uh, the device addictive present methods have been very harmful to children and it is very important that i uh, uh, i give you a research finding that uh, the device addictive has found that the students are unable to stay away even for uh, 30 minutes hmm. they have become so addictive and if you stop it take it away they show anger crying not listening to parents showing irritable behavior when asked to leave, uh, uh, leave the device it has also shown that 66.69 have physical problems 23 to 40% have gained weight 26 to 90% have uh, gained headache and irritability 20 to 4% uh, have uh, shown eye pain and itching 70.70 have behavior problems 23.9 have uh, not followed daily routine 20.90 became careless and 36.80 became stubborn this will be good for uh, parents uh, watching this show to so, come out of this what do we do how do we how do we make the children write on a screen the physical classroom space is converted into a, a monitor it's not possible to make the children write hand holding by the teacher or the parent is a must and therefore they should be made to write when it comes to higher classes it is quite possible that uh, we will be able to do some kind of online education but classroom teaching is also a must so therefore as time passed by we should be able to what the post pandemic period we should be able to mix online and offline a blended form of learning and that should be given to uh, uh students and in and uh, we must uh, convert this uh, a, a, this particular opportunity as an opportunity blessing in disguise for uh, coping with the changing environment and uh, in the post covid scenario the 
especially the government schools and uh, uh, public education system has to cope up with the uh, coping up with the improving the edu educational infrastructure online infrastructure of the schools which has not happened for the last uh, 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 several years now at least the digital divide has made them conscious that there is a uh, problem there is a setback in the whole system that they have been practicing for the last 40 years we have not invested enough for the public education system and that's the reason why we have the shortbacks the online education system has been a privilege of the few schools and colleges uh, uh, elite schools and colleges public schools have been denied of it except in uh, goa kerala and partially in delhi other states have very significant uh, growth as far as the digital divide is concerned and therefore they should take this as an opportunity to upgrade their uh, in, uh, online infrastructure in schools and they should have, okay. invest heavily in education so that then and then alone the nation can become a developed nation thank you i truly i truly agree and i think it's just the variation in, in in Dr. Pillay's voice uh, showed the kind of passion that he really feels when he talks about you know uh, uh, equal opportunity for children. I think it, it's 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 so it's remarkable. And when whilst you were discussing the percentages in your in the clinical research, doctor, I was actually going back and thinking about my child and which part of that was was he actually you know displaying. Uh, it, it's frightening. But then, like you said, uh, this conversation is about hope. So whilst you say that this is also going to change a lot of things it's going to bring a lot of focus on you know um, the divide between public and private education and i think that's the hopeful uh, nature of this conversation so thank you so much uh, you know Dr. parents have really to be uh, par parents have to be along with the children agree working I with the that... children to see that uh, this divide is not uh, uh, you know extended Agree. I have my Agree. grandchildren. I, I observe the same thing, and therefore, it's very important that we understand. Absolutely, I think all of us as parents and children, you know, grandparents, resonate with that very much. So, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to um, ask very quickly, uh, Dr. Hegde, uh, a very, very simple question. Um, with with all the attention and the momentum, uh, you know, uh, that's that's all the attention that the pharma industry today has, Dr. Hegde, and the kind of momentum of uh, you know change that it's bringing. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, you know, check, I mean, ask you, what are you going to do to maintain that momentum to change the repetition of the industry? Are there any long time, long term plans? Because everyone's focusing on you, you know, right now, you are the, the center of all the attention. Um, everything is about what right, what wrong. So, uh, you know, very quickly, if, if it's all right to ask. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very relevant question, Annie, for the pharma industry. Yeah. And I think the focus is going to be in the industry. Uh, how can it be more responsive? Uh, how it can be more agile? How can it build a resiliency in the response from uh, any any such demand which is being there? So that's going to be, in my opinion, a major part that the industry will have to keep delivering uh, to make sure it gains the confidence of the people. Secondly, uh, the question is of transparency. So we have to be very, very transparent in terms of the kind of work being done, how we are trying to get there, what issues are being faced there. I think awareness, creating that awareness among the general people becomes very important uh, uh, for the pharma industry. And uh, another thing which is also going to be important for the pharma industry is, as I mentioned earlier, during the times of the pa pandemic, there has been unprecedented level of cooperation between the industry partners. So I think it's going to be on the industry to keep assuring the public that they are not working for individual gains as a company, but they are taking care to attend the medical needs of the patients, unmet medical needs of the patient and keep delivering on time by collaborating openly rather than working in silos. The, the emphasis is going to be how can we cut the timelines by collaborating with each other. That's going to be the major part and challenge for the pharma industry uh, going ahead. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Another thing I'm, I can think about is yes. the importance of 
commercialization of research. As an industrial pharmacist, I have always been involved in commercializing research. Research that is done uh, should not be restricted to academics, not just for publishing papers. How, how can you make the people benefit out of your research? So the focus is always going to be on commercialization of research and timely commercialization. The focus on this pandemic has showed how dependent people are, for example, on the development of vaccines. People are just hoping that something comes up very soon. So this is where the industry will have to act, uh, uh, excel at cutting down the timelines. I'm sure we will have the full support of the regulators in terms of the assessment of the uh, risk benefit analysis, and they would be willing to go for approval in a timely manner. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's very aptly, very, very simply answered. Uh, I really appreciate that. Very honest answer from your end. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Bhartwaj, uh, a, a quick last question. Uh, you know, the industry experts have predicted that the aviation will be one of the sectors that's going to be leading the change uh, going forward. Uh, what are your views on this and how do you see this panning out in, in the future, please? Well, the aviation sector is has been one of those sectors where it's almost at the cutting edge of a lot of things we have done in the past. Uh, so with respect to aviation, uh, I do want to touch a little bit on what kind of changes we can expect. Uh, I think until our pharma pharmaceutical industry and the doctors gave us assurance that, you know, take this tablet, take this injection, you will be protected. I think that that is some time away. Uh, in the meantime, there are a lot of things that we can do in terms of protecting ourselves. Uh, and uh, I understand there are consequences, you know, like the shutdowns have created, uh, you know, its own set of new challenges. But when it comes to travel, uh, I think the, the Confident Travel Initiative I mentioned is on the uh, on the path of changing ourselves. Uh, right now, we can change ourselves by taking certain kinds of precautions. Uh, if you go to airports today, maybe you have seen some videos of what some of the airports are doing. There's a very beautiful video put out by the Bangalore International Airport. Uh, they show you what kinds of changes have, are happening as you approach the airport. It starts from home. You know, how you travel to the airport, what happens when you get there, how do you register, how do you show them that you are a valid passenger, how your luggage is handled. At every one of these stages, new procedures are being introduced in order to enhance the safety of the passenger. Similar things are happening inside the airplane. Now, the airplanes used to be cleaned, you know, even before, but now there is a much greater uh, detailed attention being given in terms of how do you disinfect the airplane, what kind of chemicals you can use, because you also want the airplane to be able to leave the airport fairly quickly. So there, you know, Boeing is working with airlines, with government officials, both in India as well as, you know, throughout the world in terms of determining what kinds of, you know, cleaning protocol you can have, what kind of chemicals you can use. Now, in the airplane, it turns out the air is circulated much more frequently than in most other places that we know. In fact, the number of times the air is circulated is, you know, every every two to three minutes, you know, the air is circulated. Uh, in hospitals, it is more like, you know, a longer time. You know, hospitals, it is 10 to 15 minutes. So it's actually, uh, in that sense, you are safer in an airplane than in a hospital, probably. Uh, but then, you know, these are protocols that we have to put into place. Now, what happens in the future? You know, you talked about what changes, what leading changes are happening. Research is being done. New ideas are being checked into. Uh, can you create uh, surfaces that are, you know, that are automatically virus-free? Uh, can you create, uh, for example, the lavatory in the airplane is very small. Can you make it self-disinfecting, for example, using UV, UV light? So there are things like that that the industry is looking at uh, because I think travel is a very, very fundamental freedom. 
uh, people express their freedom by being able to travel, whether it is short distance or long distance. And many people are impacted now because sometimes even families are not together because they kind of got stuck in one country, the rest of their family is somewhere else. So there are things happening, uh, you know, with respect to aviation. Uh, and I think what this will cause, just like in the medical industry, just like in the in the education sector, these will create new ways of addressing the, you know, how what we want to accomplish. For example, you know, two years from now, we may see a different kind of approach to travel. We cannot change airplanes in two years, yes. but how we use yes. the airplane, what we do inside the airplane, those kinds of things, you will see differences. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you uh, it, it's created so much reassurance, uh, you know, that there is going to be change. It is going to be positive. Um, now, I'd like to actually, um, you know, uh, uh, find out if there are any questions that we have from our audience and uh, see if, uh, you know, if I can get them answered. So, so there's a question here from um, Rama. I'm not ready. So say some yeah. universities are being forced by uh, government decrees to award degrees without um, appearing for the examination should the government take such an academic decision i think this is something that should come to dr uh, pille well uh, it's a very interesting question and i am forced to refer a case to a uh, case in delhi in the university when uh, dr uh, s radhakrishnan was the president of india someone passed out uh, without passing the 10th grade you could go to the 12th you could still pass out even today the rules exist and mm -hmm. uh, he, he passed the 12th he passed the degree he graduation post graduation he became a phd holder and then finally they found in the university that he has not passed the 10th grade 10th grade so Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, the president of India, then said that since he has already passed the 12th standard, he passed the graduation, he passed the post-graduation, he did a PhD, and we should award him an SSC program, I mean, a secondary school certificate. Okay. So it all depends on how you look at it. But in this case, what I feel is that uh, students have already reached the final year of the examination. He has done several exams, first year, second year, third year. Mm -hmm. Our results are cumulative. And then we had the first semester and the second semester, the practical, everything added with the final examination. So final examination can be just average of all the four years put together without uh, you can promote the child and award him a degree so that the year is not lost. People mm -hmm. will not lose their, uh, uh, you know, year. And the next academic, no, when will you conduct the exam, declare the results, when you start the post-graduation or PhD or higher education in other universities, all these will be problems. So a, a wise, uh, comfortable decision like this might be able to uh, go a long way in deciding the uh, acad smoothness of the academic session. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, uh, do we have another question? I mean, we have. Yes, we do. So uh, we have Dr. Jayanta who says, well, I have a question to Dr. Hegde. This pandemic has shown the ability of Indian research scenarios. We are equally capable of doing high quality research. How about Indian? Uh, how about the Industry Inst Institute interface? Dr. Hegde. Yeah, uh, very relevant question as well. As I said earlier, I think this is something that's going to be in focus. Uh, yes, we have done, uh, we, India is capable of very high quality research, but when we compare the industry uh, academic uh, collaborations and the success, how you measure the success of this collaboration is how you bring technologies to the marketplace. So it could vary for different industries, but definitely in pharma, there is a lot of scope in bringing uh, this collaboration or in increasing this level of collaboration with a view to uh, success as well. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hector. Uh, we have another question uh, from Subodh, and this is for you, uh, Dr. Bhardwaj. He says, what do you feel that the travel bubble will be successful and safe? It's a question many of us uh, were really wanting to know, but that I think it got, should come from you. And thank you, Subodh. Right. I, I certainly hope so. Uh, I mean, the uh, one thing we must, uh, I think, understand uh, the people who are making these decisions, they are not doing them in haste. There is a lot of consultation done uh, between governments. Again, you know, the travel bubble is between specific countries, you know, India with a particular country, with France, for example. Uh, and France has certain protocols. India has certain protocols. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is trying to say that if we follow certain protocols, the risk is accepted uh, because there are literally hundreds, maybe thousands of people who are stranded in different countries. I personally know a few. Uh, I'm sure there are many more like that. So this is basically saying that, you know, we cannot be living in this, you know, lockdown kind of condition forever. We do need to make progress. We need to take you know, reasonable precaution. And like I explained to you, things are, that are happening in the airplane or, you know, there are already features in the airplane uh, that we can depend upon. And now it is about if I'm traveling, say, from France to France to India, then what are the rules and regulations within France? What are the rules and regulations within India? And can we create this bubble? That's kind of what has been introduced. I certainly have a lot of you know, faith and hope in that. Uh, I think uh, there are many people who are benefiting from this kind of travel, and this will probably show us, you know, what we can do in the future, uh, even while the panic pandemic is, you know, brought to some level of control by various other measures that the other industries are taking. Um, so we have a, a final question from uh, from Rama, and Rama asks, um, uh, you know, Dr. Bardwaj, uh, do we see uh, a steep rise in the cost of airfare as a result of uh, the the beating the industry we presume has taken? So, you know, I, I don't know about a steep Dr. rise. I think we should expect a rise in the in the cost because the way you know we we pretty much live you know even even in china or 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 you know what you would consider communist countries you know we all live in a in a economy that is driven by the market and you know airlines have you know various expenses be looking to recoup those recoup those costs there are various countries, United States, India, you know, you, you know, uh, European countries, they have tried to put some kind of an assistance program to airlines because they recognize that if it is, you know, uh, if you simply take the cost and distribute it to the passengers, there will be a significant steep rise. So I think time will tell. We sh you should expect an increase, uh, whether it will be a, a steep and totally unaffordable, I don't know. Uh, I think the airlines, of course, will try not to do that, but, you know, they cannot become charitable organizations. They are already shut down and many of them are, uh, you know, generating huge amount of losses right now uh, in the airline industry. So they would certainly like to come back to, if not making big profits, at least break even. Uh, and then, you know, their costs have gone up, their expense has gone up in terms of all the different protocol that we have introduced. So we, we should expect to see some increase. Uh, hopefully it is not a very steep increase. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question for Dr. Hekta again. Uh, uh, this is uh, from Srilata and Srilata would like to know what do you feel about uh, native cures or indigenous cures for COVID? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I was expecting. Yeah. It's, it's a very, it's a very sitting on the wall kind of a question uh, to you, but that I think we just like to, you know, I think Srilasa is wanting to know. Sure. So I think when we are talking about medicine, medicine has to be evidence based. As long you have, as long as you have the right protocols in place, how you are going to do the testing, it has to be driven by science and rationality. 
as long as you are doing that getting the necessary approvals for the protocols before doing your study as i said transparency is going to be one of the things that is going to be very important as long as you are able to give the regulators uh, the i would say the confidence that the way you are doing the research be it for any any kind whether it's for a vaccine whether it's for an indigenous cure that has that confidence has to be generated so the first focus for this is efficacy secondly it's on the safety once these two major items are satisfied i think they, there is a good chance for this even it will be the same for the indigenous cures as long as they are able to stick to the right protocols and keep transparency in the way it's being developed and the results that are going to be generated out of it these will give confidence to the regulators in order to approve any cure thank you thank you so much thank you doctor uh, now i'd like to uh, you know invite uh, dr daphne pille the lady who is leading us from the front at iwfc in india to please uh, you know help us close this and i thank you once again uh, dr daphne for the opportunity and for the information that you've been able to share with us because of this thank you so much and i'd like to hand over to dr daphne thank you we have seen from the discussions that these stalwarts from the fields of education pharma and aviation have not waited for the storm to blow over for the dust to settle in order to find answers on leading change in restarting their operations and moving forward all three sectors have taken initiatives and have looked at innovative ways to adapt to the new normal diana I totally agree with you that in today's world we should trust our intuition what you call the gut instinct. So we conclude these discussions on a very bright and optimistic note of a vaccine that will be launched soon. There are 145 vaccines in various stages of development. Thank you Dr. Hegde for this information. And there is also hope for the travel industry. Measures are being taken to open the sky school soon. We look forward to Boeing's confident travel project mentioned by Dr. Bharadwaj. And for you students in the education sector, the good news is that you will have your exam soon. Thank you Dr. Pillay for your views on the online system of education. And now for a final screen round up. Thank you all. and do subscribe to iwfci india's youtube channel to receive notifications and updates on future iwfci india events thank you thank you thank you, thank you.